to finish, you have two guys sitting there watching heterosexual porn with a director just sitting there waiting, and you're in a room masturbating for 30, 45 minutes, an hour until you can finish, and you're just sitting there like a fool with a, a room full of people just waiting on you to finish. And then when you get close, you tell the director, and they grab the camera, and they capture it. And then it, the, the end product looks like you have this thing where it was two people that were attracted to one another. Well, hey, everybody. Alan Parr here once again. And, man, I am telling you, I cannot explain how excited I am today for this interview conversation, whatever you want to call it with my, my new friend, Joshua Broom. And it's crazy because I was just telling him that I have been wanting to talk to somebody who at some point in their life was on the inside of the adult entertainment or the porn industry. And he emailed me a little while back and said, hey, I've got this testimony of what God has done. I used to be a, um, a porn star. He's now no longer in that industry and God has revolutionized his life and changed his life. I'm not going to steal any of his thunder. He's got an amazing testimony, you guys. And hey, listen, you all are going to hear some things today that are truly going to encourage you. And let me just also go off and say this, that look, this conversation is going to be graphic. We're going to be talking about some, some pretty graphic things as it relates to the inner workings of the uh, adult entertainment industry. And so this may or may not be appropriate for, for kids, for teens, because we're not trying to make you more curious about it, but we do want to educate you on it. Uh, because I want to, I want Joshua to really be open and honest, uh, and to be able to speak freely about the truth and the deception that the devil is trying to pull over our eyes to get more people sucked into this industry. And also, if you're watching this on the replay, I've got a ton of questions that I want to ask Joshua today. So I'm going to put uh, timestamps in the description. Hopefully, I pray you will watch this entire video. But if you're just one of those people who like to pick, 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 then yes, I've got some timestamps below and you can go to the questions that most interest you. So Joshua, thank you so much for being here, brother. God bless you, man. Thank you for being a part of this. Absolutely. I'm more than honored to be here, and every time I get to share my story, um, even though I've done it several times, uh, like you were saying, I try to be as open and honest and authentic as I can, and I think that each time there's something in some way that, um, that God reveals to me and I communicate um, to the people hearing. So even though I've shared it a lot, um, I think that every conversation is a brand new way of, hey, uh, this is what I did. This is what God did, and this is what God continues to do. Amen. I love that. I love that. Well, listen, um, I'm going to jump straight on in, man, because you know I'm not going to waste a lot of time with a whole bunch of leading questions and this and that and the other in terms of your, your upbringing, your family. I'm sure we'll touch on that a little bit, but I'm here to be, uh, I want to use this word loosely because I don't want anybody to think I'm new age, but I'm going to be like kind of the Oprah here. I'm going to ask the questions that my listeners are really, really interested in. So I'm going to just start off and I'm going to say, hey man, like how in the world did you even get into this industry? I mean, how did you, how, I mean, you know, most people don't have the ability to even get into this. So how, how did you get into the porn industry? Yeah, I mean, I think what you touched on is really important because specifically for guys, it's it's not an easy industry to get into. So for me, I grew up in a small town in South Carolina. I was studying theater at a college in South Carolina, and I dropped out my second semester of my sophomore year, and I moved to Hollywood. So I'd been pursuing modeling and acting, and that's why I moved to Hollywood. I wanted to be in closer proximity to that industry, and I was doing okay. And like a lot of people in Hollywood, I had to work a job in, a, in addition to the things that I was pursuing to put food on the table. And I was working at a restaurant, and this restaurant was in the middle of West Hollywood on Sunset Boulevard. And there's these four girls that are sitting in this table, and I'm waiting on them. And, and um, they ask, hey, uh, have you actually ever thought about being an actor? And I was like, yes, I, I definitely have. I, I am an actor, actually. And because for me, um, coming from a small town, it's all about who you know. 
and I thought, okay, this is going to be my opportunity to get introduced to a project, or maybe they knew a director that needed someone, and I was like, great, this is going to be awesome. And they said, no, we're talking about porn. And I was like, well, I'd seen it, but I'd never thought about doing it. And I, I like to compare it almost to like my, you know, we recently went to Disney World and my, my son saw um, Mickey Mouse, but he generally just watches cartoons and he saw Mickey Mouse, you know, a, a, a person in a Mickey Mouse costume waving to him and it was overwhelming because he couldn't believe it was real. And that's how I felt in that moment. It's like, these, like, these are real people and this is a real career that they want me to pursue. Like, this is crazy. But long story short, they said, hey, I want to introduce you to my agent. And I go there and I meet this agent and he asked me uh, three or four questions. And just being the master manipulator he was, he used those questions to paint a picture of a counterfeit version of the dream that I was pursuing. And I took the bait. Mm. Mm. So yeah, so you weren't really intending. You aren't. You weren't just like, oh, I want to be a porn star one day. Like, man, this is my dream. This is just something you kind of fell into. And the agent basically was trying to speak to your inner desires and your needs, and maybe even some insecurities, or maybe even just some voids in your life that you were trying to fill. And because it all sounded good, and I'm sure the money is good. We're going to get to that in just a moment. Um, you basically kind of hook, line, and sinker kind of went into it. Yeah, I mean, it was something that I heard him offer me this opportunity, and I knew in my gut, like, this is not how my mom raised me, this is wrong, and this is going to be in contrast to what I'm pursuing, because I, I, I knew at, you know, at a gut level, this is going to create some issues for me in the future, but... For me, it's like I did not count the cost. I just said, okay, you know, I, I told him I wanted to be an actor. Um, I do. I'm doing a lot of modeling, more acting than model. I'm more modeling than acting. Um, this is what I want to do. How did you grow up? I grew up, you know, with my mom. You know, she raised me. Blah blah blah. And he's like, oh, um, you can be famous. You can make all this money. And actually, the porn industry is shifting gears. And there's these large productions, and they're parroting movies. And with you having acting experience and being a good looking guy, man, you could have all the lead roles. You can be famous. You can, you know, for me, someone who is searching for affirmation, 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 affirmation. And what I heard was uh, a, a bootleg version of a dream that I had. But because of my insecurities, I said, okay, maybe I'm not good enough to, you know, ob obtain the thing that I really want. Maybe this will be as close as I can get. So maybe let's let's just go this direction and see what happens. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit. So tell me, tell me a little bit about your first experience, your first film. Like, what was that like? What was the set like? You know, because a lot of times people see what they see on the screen and they don't realize how staged and produced and different things that are going on. So talk a little bit about like what, what was that first experience for you and what are the things that, that you know about the actual filming of everything that most people who are viewing it really don't see or know about? I get there, there's a receptionist, there's catering, there's camera A, camera B, camera C, and someone shooting BTS rolling around with a 5D. Just like, um, there's probably 30 people on set. And there's this, you know, there's this stadium lighting of Kino flows like around this day bed. And there's this production assistant that comes up to me and he's like, hey, um, here's here's this blue pill. Um, I don't know if you need it, but I just give it to everyone. Take it if you want to take it. Don't if you don't. We need you in you know, 15, 20 minutes. And I never had a conversation with this girl. So the first lie that most people believe is that there's two people who are interested in each other, that there's a camera that just happens to be there. The reality is there's two people that generally don't even have any conversation, sometimes no eye contact, that are doing a job they are paid to do. So there's little to no chemistry and absolutely no uh, intimacy. So 
um, you know, I, I go to the bathroom and I'm looking at myself in the mirror and I'm like giving myself this, you know, not, not even a pep talk, but like, do you want to do this? If you do this, this is going to happen. You shouldn't do this. And then I start thinking about, well, they sent a town car to pick me up to bring me to set. Now, all of a sudden saying no is a little bit easier, which is, I mean, which is a little bit harder, which is intentional, I'm sure. But it's like, okay, like now backing out of this is going to be a little bit difficult because I'm going to have to call someone to say, hey, um, I'm actually not going to do this. Can you send that car to take me back home? And then when I got there, it's like, hey, this is how you get paid. And I could talk. I would love to discuss at some point the paperwork that you fill out. Um, so, but they hand you this paperwork and this is how you get paid. Just feel free to feel free to. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, but uh, there's this piece of paper that you would sign and it's like, this is how you get paid. But the reality is, yes, it's, you know, W2 or W4, but um, this is how you get paid. But in addition to that, what you're signing is all rights, you're giving away all rights to audio, video, and any images that are captured. In addition to that, you're also signing another, um, you know, you're, you're, there's an additional signature and it says that you give all rights to them to sell to third parties unlimited amount of times so that one piece of you know that one piece of footage that you are paid one time for that like I've done over a thousand movies and there's wow we're gonna come back to that <laughs> yeah but I've done over a thousand movies and there was one movie that I did it was a parody of Star Wars and it made like over a hundred million dollars and you know, I was, I was, you know, I played the lead in that, and that was a a two week production or whatever. But I say all that to say there are no royalties in porn, and you're paid one time for that day. You, you get paid a day rate, but you sign away all rights to these images. To this day, I have two hundred fake profiles on across all social media. There's pictures on Tinder that are using photographs to create fake profiles of me. These images and these uh, this uh, you know like audio and memes and all this stuff, it's everywhere. Like there's a meme on social media that's been shared over a hundred million times that I'm a part of. Never have I got paid one cent for that, but in addition to that, I have no control over those images because they're sold to not just a thousand, um, probably 200 companies that I work for those thousand scenes, but those companies sold separately audio pictures to different entities. So there's probably 10,000 pieces of data out there that are owned by hundreds of people. And wow. as, as recent of six months ago, there's new content that are being like, you know, it's a like compilation of this or remastered this or re-releasing this. And Alan, I've been out of the industry since 2012. Mm, wow. So, so that's the, the piece of paper that's just to get a check. Mm, bold lie. Wow. Absolute bold wow. lie. So I signed that paper and I'm having this conversation with myself. And long story short, I pop the pill and walk over to these lights. And, you know, it's, it was a you know a director quarterbacking you the entire time like you stop every few minutes and it's like okay do this do that and there's a there's a boom and then there's a sea light you know and there's there's people all in your personal space and you are so disconnected from what is going on it's like you're just two people trying to do a task that has nothing to do with anything that someone associate with sex and then there's editing so like you you shoot for an hour and you end up with this 20 minute product that looks like two people who are engaging in a sexual activity but the reality is there's two people who are willing to essentially prostitute themselves and be okay with it being filmed and you're manipulated by you know in in a sense where we're I'm telling you to do this I'm telling you to do that move this way move that way you know do this move this way and that's, and that's how it happens. So it's not two people who are attracted to one another and you're having this great time. It's, and I think like that was like the reason the, sh the shoots were like that, doing that over a thousand times, like that level of exposure 
was very demeaning in a sense where you know I, I ended up suffering deep dark depression later on in my career and to the point where I was suicidal and I disconnected myself from everyone but the reality is sex became so monotonous that I could do it with anyone anywhere didn't matter and but looking someone in the eye and shaking their hand was the most uncomfortable thing for me in the world because that was real. You know, and, and it's interesting that you say all this because I can hear a whole bunch of guys right now and they're, they're listening to this and they're thinking, wow, like this seems like a dream life. It seems like a dream life because they've watched pornography and they've seen these beautiful women with these perfect bodies that are just super sexual and they're just like, you know, they're craving it or at least they're acting like they're craving it. And you get to live this glamorous life. Like in their minds, they're thinking, what could be better than that? Like you're having sex every day with the most beautiful women in the world. Like what's the big deal? Why, why is that? Why is that emotionally draining or whatnot? Yeah. I mean, think about the most beautiful woman in the world. Um, let's say, would you go, would you love to go on a date with her? Sure. What if on that date she made it apparent that she didn't want to be there? She ate the meal. You guys shared a conversation, but it was apparent that she never wanted to be there and had no interest in you. She was just there because she was being paid to be there and you were both eating the meal. And that's what it was like. And, and, you know, just the, the weight of, you know, a guy in that industry. So, a director takes on all the cost. So the director is paying for the studio or you know, if they're renting a home to shoot in, you're pay the director is paying for the permits to film, the director is paying for the crew, the catering, uh, the equipment, the editing, um, all the talent on set. And the only person that doesn't get paid at the end of the day if the job is not, if the job is not done is the guy. Because if the guy can't do the job, there's no footage. If there's no footage, there's nothing to sell. So just imagine the weight of a $20,000 production being on you. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, so how, I mean, how, I mean, hey, you know, like I said, guys, we're going to be graphic and we're going to be keep it real. But like, how, how is it possible to, to maintain your arousal? For um, you know, how long are how long would you be shooting potentially sometimes? And you know, tell me tell me a little bit about like what are some of the things that men would have to do in order to stay aroused for an ungodly extended, <laughs> unnatural period of time? Yeah, I mean, everyone takes either Levitra, Viagra, Cialis, something like that. But then longer shoots, and then a lot of people, because it's one of those things, like once you start taking it, you, you become dependent on it. And, and something that I ended up doing um, is this thing called Caverjack. So Caverjack is a chemical that you inject to yourself, and it lasts for four hours. It's for paralysis patients to be intimate with their significant other. So it releases a chemical, it traps blood, and, it, and, it's, and it's happening no matter what, and whether you're reading the newspaper or you're shooting a scene. And if you use too much of it, you have to go and get lanced and allow the blood to be released. But like that, that is where I ended up. And just imagine like, you know, and that causes you like for your, you know, your, your reproductive system doesn't work the way it should. If it comes, if it, it starts to become dependent on a substance, regardless of what it is, if it becomes dependent on that, it's only going to work with that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, tell me a little bit about um, tell me a little bit about the effect of this industry on women because we're gonna dig into your story and from a man's perspective, but I know there's some women watching this as well, and so you know, speak into a little bit about what what are some of the things that women were pressured to do. I know you talked about like having them having like a no list and how they have to stay relevant, and um, what type of emotional um, perspective or effect, if you will, does, does it have on women? The reality is no one does this 
for a, the longevity of a career. It's it's one thing to make one mistake one time, um, but there's no one that stays in this industry for an extended period of time and doesn't endure tremendous mental and emotional trauma. Because at the end of the day, you just have to be real with yourself. Like you don't go to bed and lay your head on the pillow and feel proud of what you're doing. So you either suppress that and that eventually is going to, um, you know, you know, bear bear its ugly head. But um, most people they suppress it with substance. So, just to kind of touch on what you're talking about, so a girl gets in the industry, she gets an agent. That agent says, "What is on your no list? These are people that they will not work with, and things they will not do." And as they go in their career, if they have a good career, um, and then eventually, because there's so much content out, if you are someone who is popular, after you see your, your favorite person do the same thing over and over again, it's going to lose its luster. So it's like, okay, um, this agent is going to say, okay, you're, the phone stops ringing as much as it used to. Um, you're not making as much money as you used to. You're not you know, being requested to shoot as much as you used to. I know that you have these things on your no list. I've actually, ironically, I, I've actually spoke with these companies and they're willing to pay fifty, a hundred thousand dollars if you would just do this thing this one time. This thing that you said that you didn't want to do. And it's like, and if you do that, you'll be relevant again. And so more often than not, they say yes. And they'll do that thing. And then once you do it, well, you already did it one time, why not do it again? And all of a sudden that thing that you said you wouldn't do becomes something that you do on a regular basis. And then once all those things are used up, there's there's no there's nothing left to expose. So, uh, okay, well, um, if you want to continue making money, I actually run this escorting business, which is high dollar prostitution, where you spend a weekend with someone for tens of thousands of dollars. And um, you know, the, it, it, they say you're hanging out with them, but you can uh, you can you 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 know what's going to happen. So, yeah. um, so they do that, but those requests are only coming in if their name is relevant. So if, if that ship starts to, you know, sink a little bit, the only thing left is the strip club. So the thing, there's a thing that happens in the strip club, it's called feature dancing, and they, it, ultimately it's someone who is popular in some capacity, they are the feature star that night, and they pay them a fee to be there. And you know, that makes them a little bit of money. But all of a sudden, you know, after a short period of time, again, they're only a feature star if they are a star. So they have to be relevant. So all of a sudden, if they're no longer relevant, there's no one calling for movies. There's no one calling for escorting. There's no one calling for the strip club. And they've been hearing for, you know, three, four, five, six years well, this is what you have to do. You've already done this. So you, it's not like you can go get a job somewhere else. Like these are directors and agents telling people, including myself, there's like, what are you going to do? You're like, there's no way that you could ever go back into mainstream acting or modeling. Like no one's going to hire you because you're attached to all this stuff. Um, no, no one's going to want to marry you. There's no way, like you're not going to have a future. So you have to do this. It's just, you know, you make a lot of money, this is your life, just be okay with it. And after you tell someone that over and over again, regardless of if it's a lie, if you believe that lie to be true, you're going to live if that lie is truth. And these women are who are now aged out of the industry at only 30 years old, sometimes younger, um, they're looking at their life, they're like, the phone's not ringing, this is the only thing that I can do with my life, this is my worth. So 35 at this point, people who were in the industry with me at the same time, who were in their early 30s or younger, have taken their life due to suicide or overdose because they, they looked at their future and they didn't see one and they made the decision to take their life. So that is what the person 
on the other side of that screen is feeling. And the reality is some of those names are huge stars. And do you think those videos go away? No. So there is a likelihood that you are watching, if you're someone who watches this type of content, there is a very high probability that you're watching someone that took their life because of what they were doing. Mm. Mm. Wow. Um, yeah. And, and I think I remember you saying on another interview that, that a lot of them are women, you know? Yeah. So those 35 people, um, 35 of them are women. Um, and there's two people who are actually really close friends of mine who were men. Um, they ended up just putting their life in jeopardy. So my, um, one of my friends, he was inebriated to the point where he fell off a balcony in Mexico and the, the other guy, it was just a tragic accident. He was, uh, he was base jumping, but, and you just, um, yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, I want to transition a little bit cause I want to talk about, um, uh, something that I don't know how comfortable you are talking about this, but just, you know, the idea of gay porn, right. And, um, it, you know, are men able to have a no list, right? Are you able to go into the industry and say, Hey, look, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll have heterosexual sex, but not no, no gay porn. Um, and if so, you know, was that something that you, um, had on your list? And then did you ever dabble into, you know, gay porn? And if so, how did you get your mental, how did you even mentally get yourself in a place where, you're naturally attracted to women and now you're having to act out something that is completely unnatural for you. Or a better question maybe might be, you know, did you ever have any sort of same sex attractions that led you to feel like it was somewhat natural for you in the industry? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the industries are completely separate, which is ironic because so for guys, the industry is completely separate. For girls, it's just part of the heterosexual industry, which I'm not really sure how or why that makes sense. But you know, gay porn specifically to guys, because gay you know, like gay uh, porn in, in, in contrast to women, it falls in the heterose- heterosexual side of things. Which I don't, I don't even, I can't even wrap my head around why that that is. But anyway. Um, So I was in the industry for about six years and towards the end of my time in the industry, I was at the point where I was like every day I would come home and okay, today's the day. How am I going to do it? I was ready to take my life. I, so you work in every day. Yeah. I just mean, so to, people to are do, clear. Yeah. To do a thousand, to do a thousand films in, you know, a little over five years and especially taking into consideration the industry is pretty much shut down December and, and January because there's a there's a gigantic award show in January and then everyone is just trying to get every like films done on in post for that. So there, there's some shooting going on in December, but pretty minimal. So pretty much the industry is from February to um, November. So in a ten month period, doing a thousand scenes, it's pretty much every day. So I was doing you know t- twenty minimum a month and. At that point, I was, I was, I was ashamed. I was ashamed. I was depressed. I had stopped talking to my family. Um, I, I saw myself as so useless and dirty that um, how could I be a son? How could I be a big brother? Um, how could I contribute to my family in any way? And I just isolated myself from everyone and everything that was authentic in my life. And you know, being a good looking guy in the industry, um, gay companies would approach you all the time. It's like, you know, name your number and we'll make it happen. Just like, just tell, tell me how much money you need. And the answer is yes. And for me, it was like, there's nothing else I can do other than to sell myself for sex. That's who I am. I define myself by my behavior. And also, um, something you touched on, it's like, you know, this attraction thing, very, very little was there attraction between two people. It's like two people that didn't, like more often than not, two people that didn't want to be there doing this thing that they believed this was the only thing they could do to make a living. And so, you know, that on on the, the female end, like sometimes they were, 
they were either inebriated to some some capacity or they had to mask the pain afterwards, uh, mo emotional pain afterwards. Um, so two, like two very disconnected people. So like I was saying, so sex became so monotonous that um, there, there was no attraction. You know, like the guys were using, um, you know, erectile dysfunction medication and the girls are using lubrication so this can happen. Like there, there's no... Um, th this is amazing and these two people are coming together and it looks awesome. It's like either uh, you do what you're being paid to do or you're not going to get hired to do it. So does it look like um, something that uh, you would want to be part of? Maybe, but you need to know that those two people are doing their job. And they're, and, they're, and they're doing, you know, taking whatever means they need to take to be able to do that job because they believe that if that job doesn't get done, they're not going to get hired. Like as a guy, um, if you like failed a scene, more often than not, that director is not going to hire you again because you just cost him twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, time, studio, space. So, so yeah. more often than so, almost always, a director is going to have ten to twelve guys because, especially in the heterosexual side of things, it doesn't matter the guy, like who it is. You're reliable. You're you know a decent looking guy. Great. You can get the job done. Awesome. I'm going to hire you every time because I need to know that you're reliable. And that's really the only thing that I care about. And it's like, okay, you're willing to take the shot or do whatever. So it, the, you know, the job gets done. Great. So you're going to get hired every time. So the guys, you know, you, you're around the same guys over and over again. But I paint that picture to say at my life, it was like either die or I don't know. And then for some reason in my life, I, I get, a phone call. It's like, hey, um, name your number, and you can do three scenes a month if you're willing to do gay porn. Uh, and it was like for me, it's like I didn't care. Like it, it wasn't like I was being intimate with a person. I was doing an action. I didn't care who it was with. So for me, it was like, okay, maybe that would help subside the pain, and I would continue to make high six figures. It was like whatever, because that money and the fame and the, it was a band-aid for the pain to a, to a certain degree. So I said yes to that, and I, th I thought that it would be better, but actually it was an additional thing that amplified my depression and amplified that pain. So like, how do people do that? It's, um, I mean, I I'll be pretty graphic um, just to let you know. Um, but so there's two guys who are on set, like specifically um, the gay side of things. There's two guys who are on set. More directors than not will not only require you, but have someone on set to do that shot that I was talking about, the cabbage app. And then, so the shot, so it's like you, you can't feel it. So you can't finish so to finish you have two guys sitting there watching heterosexual porn with a director just sitting there waiting and you're in a room masturbating for 30 45 minutes an hour until you can finish and you're just sitting there like a fool with a a room full of people just waiting on you to finish and then when you get close you tell the director and they grab the camera and they capture it and then it the end product looks like you have this thing where it was two people that were attracted to one another and they did this action. And the reality is you have two people that I think I met two people who identified as homosexual in that entire industry. Two people who were taking the, like, taking the means of taking a shot that could potentially cause you to never be able to have an erection again. And... Really? So, well, yeah. I mean, because if you become dependent on that, I mean, right, right. I mean that they could take. For me, it took like after I stopped doing films, like it took several months for it for for my body to function normally. But I mean, there's cases where you know you take too much and you have to go to the hospital and get you know you literally have to get lanced, almost like you know that my finger like a staph infection, right? So if you're if you have a staph infection, you have all this pressure in your finger if you don't get it lanced and let the blood out your finger's probably going to fall off and it's not going to yeah. function the way it should 
So yeah. um, that's the case. So what you're saying is that, yeah, so you're saying that you got two, just to summarize, you're saying you got two people, two guys that are in there 99 times out of 100. They're not necessarily attracted to each other. They don't identify as gay and they're just doing their job. It pays a lot more money because it's harder to find people who are probably going to be agreeing to do this particular, um, these particular acts. And then you're saying that, these guys are stimulating themselves watching heterosexual porn, masturbating so that essentially um, when it's time for them to climax, then yeah. they say, hey, go get back in there and finish up so we can capture it. Because it's not naturally something that you're like, oh, you know, I'm attracted to this person. It's it's naturally, I'm about to naturally climax. The, the sad part is to kind of lean into this tension that we've, we've probably created to, to just to create that clear picture um, so you're not getting back in there. You're doing that in a room full of people. Like there, okay. there, there is no privacy. You're, you're in there with a room full of people. So the sound guy is still in there. The cameramen are still in there. The directors are still in there. More often than not, you're in a studio full of people and you're sitting there like an idiot masturbating so that you can climax. So that because if you don't, you don't get paid. Wow. Wow. Okay. So, um, so, uh, also, okay. So if once you get into on that side of the industry, is it possible to got to start going back and forth into the heterosexual industry or is it a situation where it's like, okay, once you go that direction, it's really hard for you to kind of get back to, um, the heterosexual side of the industry. Uh, so yeah, so um, ten years ago when I was in the industry, it was an absolute like once you did that, you couldn't go back. Um, but really, unless, I mean, there they were there are cases that people were in that industry and left, and they had a hard time getting jobs, and eventually, you know, they they started getting hired and they worked a few times. But like more often than not, there would be girls that would not work with guys who did that. And it just it's just a strange like thing to navigate through because when we say gay, like you wouldn't exclude women from that in any other aspect. But right. when in regards to porn, like that that does not fall under gay porn. Gay porn specifically is male on male. Mm, yeah. Because they're praying they're 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 praying to what most men probably want to see, which is two women together or two women and a guy or a guy with three women or something crazy like that. So yeah, that's going to be in the heterosexual. Um, yeah, I, I, that makes sense um, in a warped yeah. kind of way. Um, wow. So, okay. Um, earlier you talked about making money and just tell me a little bit about how much money did you actually make in the industry while you were in it? And then what type of success did you personally experience success according to the world standards? Obviously, we know not in God's standards, but according to the world standards, what, what, how high up did you did you rise in that industry, and how much money did you ultimately make? Yeah, so over the over the about six years I was in in the industry, I made one point one million dollars, and then kind of what you were talking about with you know the the gay porn in contrast to the heterosexual porn. Um, so a guy would normally get between a thousand to two thousand dollars per scene, and then in straight porn, I, 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 this is someone starting in the industry. So someone just starting out in the industry, a, a guy would make three to five hundred dollars per scene. So astronomically different. But you know, and, and then as you grow, you know, the more popular you are, you know, a guy would make closer to a thousand dollars in heterosexual, and then as much as five thousand dollars in gay porn per scene. But yeah, I mean astronomically different but yeah I, I made 1.1 million dollars the time I was in the industry and I was nominated for best male performer in the in the heterosexual world I was named for um, best male performer I was nominated for it three times and in 2012 um, I won it but like in 2012 you know it's from the, the work from 2011 but um, in 2012 I won that award and you know I made all this money I you know, 
traveled the world. I, I made films in Costa Rica, London, Paris, Mexico, um, Romania, Canada, like, you know, all over, all over the place. And um, when I won that award, I, you know, it was something that I was looking forward to, but I wasn't, I wasn't there. Like I didn't show up because in that moment it was kind of a, okay, you know, I, I had achieved all this success that I believed would fill this void in my life and it didn't work. And when it, when I realized I had obtained the thing that I thought would bring me happiness and it didn't make me happy, it amplified my brokenness. And that was, you know, in, in that moment, I was kind of, okay, what am I going to do? Um, and then soon after that, I said yes to um, the gay the gay contract. So I, I signed a, a really big contract with a company and I worked, you know, shooting three times a month. And that lasted for a little bit. And then I just came home one day and I was like, I'm, 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 I'm going to take my life. Like, let's, like, let's, let's make a plan. Like, how can I do it? You know, I, I don't think I can like, you know, I, I won't get into it, but I was making a plan to do it. Yeah. Cause we're going to, I'm sure we're going to, we're going to unpack your testimony in just a moment. Um, and then, uh, and then I have that and then you know, like, I'm ready to do it. I, I'm, I'm take I've taken measures to where I'm like, I'm ready to do this. And, um, I have an interaction at a bank that changed my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to get into that too. Um, a couple of other questions here before we delve into obviously the most important part of your story is um, what God did. But um, just a couple other questions here while I'm on this. What was what was dating like? Uh, you know, while you're in this industry, I mean, because I'm sure that's a question a lot of people are wondering is, you know, is it possible to have any sort of decent relationship? Uh, and what was, what was it like whenever you're trying to meet a young lady, you're trying to date her, but then you have to tell her what you do for a living. And, and, um, you know, did you find that most women were okay with that or, um, you know, or maybe they just had, um, uh, you know, some sort of resistance to it or whatnot. So what, what was that like? Yeah. So, um, women were okay, um, having a one night stand, but no interest in having a relationship in regard to women outside of the industry. So more often than not, um, relationships would happen um, with in between people in the industry, more often than not. You would see women who are dating men, um, and then, I mean, we could talk about this for a long time, but there's, uh, there, there's a, a very clear um, pattern of women who date men outside of the industry but those men are angry at the end of the day because there, there is, um, even though if it's not addressed, it is infidelity. And they're trying to suppress that, but there's abuse and there's a long history of murder between someone dating a man in outside of the industry and a girl's in the industry. And there's tremendous amounts of abuse and a pretty uh, large history of murder. But... Um, for me that like, this was probably one of the most men mentally unhealthy, um, things that I ever experienced because, so I was, I was dating, there was three different people that I dated for a decent amount of time in the industry and they were pretty well known, pretty popular in the industry and kind of what I was telling you earlier a guy in the industry, there's 10 to 15 guys that were consistently working around 20 times a month. So here's the reality. You're two people who are in a monogamous relationship, yet having sex with other people for a living. Um, and you hang out with the people you are around the most. More often than not, you'll have situational or work friendships. And, you know, if I'm working 20 times a month, that doesn't leave a lot of time outside of that industry. So I was friends with most of the guys in the industry. And you'd be sitting at a table. Um, I remember so clearly, so we were at um, one of my favorite restaurants, Mastro's. And we're sitting at a table eating dinner. 
and the person that I was dating, um, who we were living together at the time, um, we were dating, and across the table was a friend of mine, and she had worked with him that week, and then his wife, I had worked with her that previous day, and we're sitting at dinner together, having this casual conversation, wow. completely pretending that what transpired was just work and in no way applicable to reality. So, so just that being a thing, like weighed on me a lot because I grew up, um, you know, my mom had me when she was 16 and I was the, I was the guy that, you know, my mom is gorgeous. So, I mean, I'm this guy like, you know, ready to knock out like guys in the grocery store when I'm five, six years old, like, you know, people whistling at my mom, I'm like throwing cans of corn at them, you know? Um, and that I've always been like, you know, I grew up in South Carolina, so I was like a Southern boy and I'm protect your mom. So it like, it created this spirit of jealousy in, a, in some way. So that carried over to relationships. So there's this person who is insecure and jealous and I'm dating someone. So I'm pretending that just doesn't bother me. And then someone I was dating, they suggested, hey, is it, I, I would love to discuss what happens at work. I think that that's, you know, that, that, that was a fetish, you know, so, and then for me, it was like, gosh, like I was such a people pleaser. And so like, I don't know, like my, my reality was so distorted and I just, I, I just tried to put on a mask each and every day where it's like, well, if, if this is what she wants, then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm weird if, if, you know, I don't say yes to it or, or she's going to leave me or she's going to want to be with someone else. So um, I, I, I invited that into our relationship and man, um, the mental and emotional trauma that I was suppressing while I was saying that it was okay was, it was, it was not good. And, and that, I mean, that impacted me for a long time. Were you, were you able to turn off your work mode and become boyfriend mode? Like, because having sex was what you did for a living, right? I mean, so like, so while you're working from nine to five, this is your job, but then right. were you able to actually, I mean, if you don't mind me asking, like, were you able to actually have a somewhat semblance of a healthy, intimate sex life with someone that you're... Yeah, I mean, was it healthy? Absolutely not, but um, I mean, it happened, but still like right. for for me... And for them, the reality is, and the reality for so many people who are in the industry, every day you stay in that industry, you come, you become more the person you're not and less the person you are. So at that point, like Joshua Broom didn't exist. So that's why like that, that moment in my testimony, like I had, st like no one in my life called me by my real name because it was almost like Joshua stopped existing and there was only this fictitious, this fictitious person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, last question before we jump into your testimony, but another question I think people might want to ask about is like, how do, how do people in this industry protect from STDs and things like that? Or even you know, pregnancies and things like that. I mean, because if you're sleeping with all these different people all the time, are you constantly getting tested or, you know, is it common for people to, to, to have these transmitted diseases? Um, what's that, what does that look like? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. So, um, there is a standardized testing facility. So there's an, a lab that the industry owns and, so that way they can control um, as many data points as possible. So, you know, that's where everyone gets tested. And also there's, um, there's a governing body of like how many days you could go without having an active test. So, you know, for you to have uh, a test that was current, um, for, for some people, for some companies, it was 14 days. Uh, for some people, it was short as three days. The longest I would see was 21 days. 
but people would have to have an act like that would be the very first thing so you have to when you go on set you have to have two forms of identification and a copy of your test and then they would look up that test and on a website and make sure that your test was active and it couldn't expire within two days so like that is the way that they protected against STDs but the reality is um, there's escorting that's going on there's people you know having sex outside of the scene so um, are you completely protected against STDs no um, there's there's no one that worked that many scenes without getting like chlamydia or gonorrhea like there's there's no one that didn't contract that at some time like i like no one if, if you stayed in the industry for a, a, a long period of time and then unfortunately that there have been cases of people getting aids but i think i think um i mean like as far as i know like less than 10 in the last 20 years but um yeah yeah, so, I mean, does, does that happen? Yeah. Um, is there a protocol set in place? Yes, but the protocol only works as well as, you know, you protect mm -hmm. yourself. So, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, yeah. That, that is the reality of the industry. And the, it's just one of those things where, like, if a normal person got gonorrhea or chlamydia, it could be, you know, it, that, that could scar them for the rest of their life. In, like emotionally, right. you know, like right. the reality is you go and take a penicillin, a penicillin shot and it's gone in three days. But it's like for someone, it's like, gosh, the, the, how dirty you would feel and how betrayed you would feel by another person. Um, like I, I, I can't even imagine, but for me, it was like, just, it was just part. It's just know, part of, it's part of, it's, it's just like, a, it's like an NBA player getting a sprained ankle. It's just, it's just, right. of, it's just, just part of, it's just part of being analogy. out there, you know? But, um, yeah. but yeah, so, I mean, that is, is very interesting. So, um, pretty recently, I think like maybe, maybe three to five years ago. So everything, you know, probably everyone thinks everything is shot in the Valley in California. California actually mandated condoms to be for all porn scenes shot because you have to have a permit to be shooting pornography. Yeah, there's a specific permit that you have to acquire because if you don't and, you know, someone comes to set and you're not using those that, you know, you're, you're going to get fined. Um, I know it's so strange, but <laughs> that's real. And so the entire industry pretty much moved to Las Vegas to move to Nevada because there wasn't oh. those ordinance. Oh, okay. But, okay. Um, but but there are a lot of companies on the heterosexual side there's there's two companies that I know that always have been condom but most companies in the heterosexual side are not condom and then on the gay side of things everything is a hundred percent condom oh wow okay okay so okay so now this is obviously the most important part we want to transition to how did you get out um, uh, what does your testimony look like? At what point did you become a Christian? And, and man, this, it, I, I wanted to get into this earlier, obviously, because I normally try to keep these, these, uh, interviews to about an hour, but you know what, it, this is to me, this, forget that, forget that. I, this is more important than just me sticking to my hour time, time limit. And so I just want you to speak freely on like, how did you get out? how did you have the courage? What did that look like? And, um, and, and yeah, and I've got a few questions here about that, but I'll let you kind of, um, just speak yeah. to how you got out, how, how you found Christ and, and what life looks like for you now. So I had done a scene I was filming. Um, I wasn't local. I was, I filmed a scene somewhere and I, fl I flew back. Um, I got to LAX, got my bag and went to my apartment and, I had a check, and why is this a big deal? Because on my checks, there's a memo, and on the memo of the check is what the movie was, and the movie always had a very graphic name. It's very clear what that check was for. I, did, I was ashamed, so I didn't want to deal with that. But on this day, I walk up to this counter and slide the check across the counter. I was like, I would like to deposit this check, please. Do you have your account number? No. Swipe my card. She looks it up. You know, everything's 
taken care of, hands me my receipt, and I pivot to walk away. And as I'm walking away, she says, Joshua, is there something I can do for you? Joshua, can I help you in any way? And it shook me, man. It shook me to my bones. Like I have chill bumps right now um, because that was actually the first time I had heard my name in over a year. And it shattered this fake, plausible reality that I'd created because of my shame. And I immediately thought about my mom. And I, I walked home and I looked myself in the mirror and I had no clue who that person that was looking back at me was. It was almost like I could see and feel for the first time in a long time. And what I felt was me not returning my mom's calls, me not returning her, her text. And just to be really honest in this moment, like I missed some things that I should have been there for. She had gotten married, and within months, his pancreas ruptured, and he died. And I wasn't there because I didn't pick up that phone call because I was so ashamed of who I was. And then I, I later I found out that, and then I didn't have the guts to call her and see if she was okay. I didn't have the guts to check on her and, and tell her I was sorry that I wasn't there. But in that moment, I started feeling that. And I got angry and I wept and I went through a roller coaster of emotions. And I picked up the phone and I called my agent and I quit. And I called the company that I was contracted by and I quit. And I called my PR person and I put out a press release. And I was like, I quit. And um, I ran home to my mom. And it was a very Luke 15 prodigal son like moment where I thought, you know. She's going to be mad at me. You know, I'm like, okay, just let me, just let me live here. You know, um, I, I just don't want to be in the pigsty anymore. I just, I, I just want to like be near my mom. And she was just glad I was home. I deleted my social media. Um, I tried to change my hairstyle. I did everything I could to try to cover up, you know, me being who I was. But the reality is because there's so much content and the way it would flow out, um, I'm working in a grocery store and a gym and everyone I meet, they're like, you're, aren't you, you're, the, are you everywhere I went at this other gym? I meet this person. They, they, they started coming to the gym. Um, and I was like, Hey, it's a, it's a girl. And I, I walk over to her and, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to be, you know, my, my Southern, uh, gentleman self. I'm like, Hey, you know what? Let me put your weights away. I, I saw you just finish the workout. Let me put your weights away for you. She's like, no, nah, I'm good. I was like, man, <laughs> I was like, well, can we go out? Can we, can we go out to dinner? And she's like, no, <laughs> I was like, gosh. Um, and then she's like, well, we can go for a run. I was like, okay, like whatever I need to do to hang out with this girl. Sure. And we meet up, and I'm sitting there waiting on her to, we're, we met at this like trail we're going to running at, and I'm sitting there waiting for her to get there, and I'm thinking about, man, um, I feel pretty guilty right now, because I know that this innocent person doesn't know who I am, and so many people, Alan. I hurt because I was not honest because, you know, either we became friends and I didn't tell them about my past or, you know, I went on a few dates with someone. I didn't tell them about my past. I was like, you know what? She does not deserve to feel one ounce of pain because of something I did. Um, so I'm just going to tell her and she'll probably just, you know, She'll probably be nice about it and just not talk to me anymore. Or, you know, worst case scenario, she karate chops me in the throat. You know, like what, what could happen? And this run quickly turns into a walk and we're talking and I was like, I want to tell you something. Um, I did a, a little bit of porn. She was like, excuse me? What's, what'd you say? And and then I just, I told her everything. I told her every everything. Like I told her... 
like more than she needed to know or wanted to know, I'm sure. And at the end of that, um, she just looks at me and says, um, after a while of me not knowing how she's going to respond, because she obviously was a, a processor, so she was just kind of you know taking that information in. She's like, well, um, I did not expect for you to say that, but the person I see standing in front of me, like that's that's not the person that I see. What you just described to me, and I want you to know that. Um, a person is not defined by the worst things they'll ever do. Like your your mistakes, that doesn't define who you are. And and whatever you accomplish in the future, like your greatest accomplishment, like that doesn't define who you are. Like God defines who you are. Like do do you know who God is? I had heard about God. I knew attributes about God. And I even went as far as like, you know, yeah, you know, um, I know that, you know, God, you know, he... Uh, Time, space, and matter came into existence at the same time. So if that is true, then there must have been someone outside of that that created all those things. So yeah, like God created everything. God created me. Yes. I'm a, you know, yeah. And she was like, okay, that's great. Um, do you have a relationship with God? And I was like, I, I don't know. And she, but and she didn't ask it like in an abrasive way. She just, you know, asked me that question, and I genuinely sure. didn't know the answer. I was like, I don't, I don't know. And then she's like, okay, well, you know, and just shared a little bit about her faith with me, and and then she quickly pivoted. <laughs> she she pivoted. She was like, you know, tell me about yourself. You know, what do you like? What, what was your family like growing up? What's your family like now? What do you like to do? What are some of your goals, aspirations? Yeah. And for the first time in a very long time, I was myself and I wasn't rejected. And I saw myself through the lens of I wasn't necessarily my behavior. Mm -hmm. And like really like ushered me into the presence of God, like a real like, you know, Colossians 4, 6, you know, let your speech be yeah. gracious and seasoned with salt. It's like how you ought to answer each person and how she responded to what I said, her response, I experience the love and grace and the peace of Jesus. Because how do you respond to something like that if you don't have yeah. peace? And it just, it cultivated this curiosity in me. And she, you know, after the, after our run slash walk was over, we went home, you know, we, we went about our business. Then we text throughout the week, and then she asked me, she's like, hey, I'm going to church on Sunday. I was like, okay, cool. Um, you know, She's like, do you want to go to church together? And then we actually found this church that neither one of us had been to before. And I get there, and um, the mission statement, like when you're walking the door, mission statement, um, we want to meet people where they are and encourage them to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And I was like, you want to meet me where I'm at? And then I hear this man who reminds me of my grandfather in a lot of way, like real Southern accent from Durham, North Carolina, um, just being really raw and transparent about like him not being perfect. And he tells this story of Mephibosheth and how Mephibosheth thought he was going to die because he was from a previous kingship. He was part of this family and historically... When a new king, you know, sat on the throne, the previous family was wiped out. So he yep. thought death was coming to him. And he's yep. sitting there, and he's already crippled, and he's broken, and he's on the street begging. And this, you know, this king's guard comes up to him, and he thinks, okay, you know, this is it. I'm going to die. Yep. And instead, the guard reaches out his hand, helps him up, and he ends up at the king's table. Not for a day, not for a week but for the rest of his life. Yeah. And then he pivoted to how Jesus sees us in the middle of our sin and offers us grace and starts to unpack grace. And I start listening, like I'm on the edge of my seat, like mm -hmm. really like this is like starting to make its way to my heart. Yeah. And, you know, talking about like, this is how, you know, God continues to pursue us. And like, and through Jesus, this, this, this work has been done that we could never do on our own. 
but it has been done for us. And it's out of love and talking about, you know, the, the father. And I, I don't know. It was just like something that I'd honestly heard many, many times all of a sudden became real. So did you get, so do I assume you got saved um, yeah, you, yeah, so soon after that, that baptized? Yeah, so I, I in that moment I gave my life to Christ and I was like weeping and I was like, I'm an emotional guy. Like <laughs> I'm, you know, so I was, I, I, I was like on my knees, like weeping. And, um, and then like ironically, like, um, like, not not my favorite song in the world, but like just like perfect moment, like good good father was like the the, the song that yeah. played like after the service. Oh wow! Yeah. And just like for me in that moment, it's like man, um, the father that I've always wanted, I actually always had. Mm. And like for me, it's like yeah, like from um, from a theological standpoint, like I understood, but in that moment, my heart surrendered, and I felt a lifetime, Alan, of not. Not just the shame of being in the porn industry, feeling like I wasn't enough my entire life. Wow, I, yeah. I felt that void yeah. be filled in a way that I don't yeah. think I could ever articulate with words. But I just felt peace and I felt loved in that moment in a way that I can't comprehend. Tell me a little bit about, um, I'm assuming you and this young lady end up getting married <laughs> So expediate the story, but yeah, so soon after that, I get baptized. Um, me and this young lady, her name is Hope. The church's name is Hope, <laughs> but um, <Wow. laughs> but uh, we, we get engaged. Um, we end up getting married. Um, yeah, so we've got three and kids. This is what year? What year is this now? Uh, 2000, 2015, we got engaged. Oh, wow. Okay. So a couple years removed. Okay. Yeah. 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 So yeah, we, we, we got engaged and we got married in 2016, but, um, yeah, so we, we got engaged, got married. I would love to know, like, you know, how does your past, um, affect if in any way, like you being able to really genuinely connect with your wife, do you have those thoughts? Do you have those do you have those memories, those images? Do you struggle with ever like making comparisons with your wife, with other women that you've been with? And I mean, I, you know, like I said, that's probably a loaded question right there. Ah. It, 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 I feel like it's an incredible question, but it has a very clear, short answer. Okay. What I found very quickly is that I had never experienced love. I had only experienced lust in everything that I've ever experienced with my wife. It was nothing I've ever experienced before. And so 2 Corinthians 5.17 is real. So the person that she knows me as is not that person because he's dead and gone. And yeah. the, everything that we've experienced together has been love. So love takes sacrifice. It takes intentionality. It takes work. Lust takes Lust serves you. That's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. Josh, man, this has been an awesome time together, man. And as you can tell, like, man, I just want to hang out with you sometime, man. So if you're ever in Dallas again, man, we got to get together. I have so many more questions that I would love to ask you. But um, how can how can people support you? Where can they find you? Um, you know, what's the best way for them to support what you're doing? Uh, now, um, you know, I'm, I mean, we didn't really, didn't, we didn't even really get too deep into what you're doing now, but I assume you're sharing your testimony, sharing the word of God. I don't know if you're on staff at a church or whatnot, or you're, you're pastoring or shepherding. I don't know, but what's, what's the best way for people to kind of support what you're doing? Right yeah. Now? So I, I was a pastor on staff at a church, um, up until about a year ago. And my wife and I decided to start a ministry because, what we what we felt like we were called to is to authentically identify, you know, or or, or I authentically communicate my story, which you know, un, under the bandwidth of being on staff at the church, like is that possible? Maybe, but there were some limitations there. But yeah. Anyway, um, yes. Yeah, so my wife and I started uh, started a ministry, and we planned on planning a church in Iowa, but what God has done, and He's opened up opportunities for um, that but more so me traveling and speaking. So the best way that anyone can reach me is uh, all of my Instagram, uh, all, all of my handles, 
is I am Joshua Broom, or uh, my website is Joshua um, Joshua dot me is my website, and I have a I have a podcast that that releases next week through Christian Post. You can find it on Edify and everywhere else. It's called Counterfeit Culture. But yeah, so I am Joshua Broom. Uh, my ministry is called Known. Um, but yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for being here, Joshua. And I'm going to put links to everything down in the description box below. But guys, I know this was a long interview, but look, I hope you really enjoyed it and hopefully you got value out of it. And uh, Joshua, thanks once again for being part of this, man. God bless you. And um, we'll do this again sometime. Absolutely, man. Sounds great. All right. Thanks, everybody.